Glory to God. Glory to God. Welcome to the Hope Bible Institute. Excuse me. My name is Dr. Young. I will be your instructor today. And today we're going to deal with the subject of client assessment. Client assessment. This is your Christian counseling course. Uh, and this is lesson number eight, client assessment. When you're dealing with a client, you have to make sure that you are understanding um, the client's problems as well as processing the client's uh, discomfort. You have to make sure that you're doing that. So I want to give you two things that I want you to write down. It's not going to be in your uh, workbook. It's not going to be in your class lesson book, but I want you to write it down somewhere. The two hardest parts of counseling, the two hardest parts of counseling is number one, paperwork. Paperwork is important. You have to document. You have to document um, everything that you're gathering, all of the data that you're gathering. Paperwork and the next part is preparation. These are the two hardest parts of counseling. Communicating with the client and just talking with the client is not the hardest part. Um, um, sitting down, having conversations, asking questions is not the hardest part. Hardest part. The hardest part is documenting. Excuse me. Documenting um, what you're gathering as well as preparing for the sessions are going to be the hardest parts of counseling. So now we're going to go into assessing the client. How do we assess? the client. Let's break it down. You must understand that in your outpatient practice or on your job, you will be ministering to people you are in who are entrusting their stories, their, their pain, and their problems to you. These are people you are ministering to. I want you to kind of circle that word in your workbook, that word ministering, because it's important. That word ministering lets me know that this is not just a job or a profession for me. I now must take on the mind of a leader who gives service. I am giving service. I am voluntarily serving others um, with the gift that God has blessed me with, and that's counseling them. Not only am I serving others, but here's an important part. I am doing it unto the Lord. If I treat it like a job, then I will clock in and clock out. But if I, if, if, if I'm giving service and then I would do what the Lord tells me to do and that is do it with all of my might and all of my energy. Now when I get these people they are trusting me. I cannot violate their trust. I have to keep their trust. They are trusting me with their stories, their pain, their problems. They're trusting me with these things. So this is not an assembly line where one part fits all. A fast food operation in which speed is the primary goal or a department store where the customer is looking for the best buys. That's not what it is. Each and every individual client must be individually evaluated, um, assessed, and in um, a prepared path must of recovery must be prepared for each client individually. You can't just package a deal together and say, okay, I'm going to do five sessions for every marriage session or every, because every client is different. Every situation is different. Their mindsets are different. Their cultural backgrounds are different. Um, the, the influences that are around them are different. Um, the conflicts are different. All of these things are different. So each client has to make, has to be, um, assessed individually, um, um, prepared and dealt with individually. And I want to tell you this, there's no shortcuts for counseling. You might want to make note of that somewhere um, uh, in your book so that you can write that down and remember that there are no shortcuts to counseling. You don't get to take the shortcut because you're dealing with lives. When you take the shortcut, you begin to guess at scenarios and situations. And you cannot afford to guess at scenarios and situations because you are dealing with lives. So this is the place where people come to grieve. When you're counseling, they come to you to grieve. This is the place where they come to find symptom relief. Feel that in your blank. They come to grieve. This is the place where they come to grieve. You have to create an atmosphere where they can come to you and grieve. Find symptom, symptom relief. Refute lies. L-I-E-S. To refute lies. They come to you to refute lies. Majority of the people you will be counseling... Um, they, 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 they're in a situation or in a mindset because of the lies that they believe. So we have a saying here at HBI that's, that, that says this, if I find the lie, I can find the problem. 
I can find, if I find the lie, I can solve the problem. Um, find the lie, find the problem, so, um, 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 refute the lie with the truth and solve the problem. So they come to refute lies, be encouraged, rebuild relationships, find hope in the midst of suffering. They come to find hope in the midst of suffering and be restored. They come to find hope and be restored. So I want you to make note of this next thing. Everyone you deal with would be in a state of crisis of some kind. There would never be a client that you would have that would not have a problem. All of your clients would have, I know that sounds crazy, but it's serious. All of your clients would have a problem or they wouldn't be your clients. So everyone you deal with would be in a state of crisis of some kind. Therefore, in a very real sense, our offices are psychological emergency rooms. When you're in an emergency room, they um, after they check your vitals and things of that nature, they begin to individually assess the clients. They begin to individually assess the clients. You 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 don't go into the emergency room. They say we're gonna cat scan everybody, or we're gonna uh, give an IV to everybody because everybody may not need an IV. Everybody may not need a cat scan. Uh, everybody. So individually they assess, and that's what you have to learn how to do in your practice. You have to learn how to psychologically, um, individually assess every single person. So, number two, we spoke about the levels of conflict in our last session. And the levels of conflict resolution, but here we're going to evaluate and determine the levels of conflict and the resolution. Before we can evaluate the levels of conflict and the resolutions, we must first do a comprehensive assessment. Feel that in your blank. A comprehensive assessment. We must first do a comprehensive assessment. A comprehensive assessment is going to um, is going to involve two major areas: the client's spiritual well-being and the client's psychological well-being. It's going to deal with their spiritual uh, state of mind and their psychological state of mind, and it's going to uh, evaluate the relationships. It's going to evaluate their history. It's going to evaluate because this is all in the assessment process. So a comprehensive assessment is important. Number three, because the psychological, physical, and spiritual dimensions of the client's problems will sometimes intersect at common points, it poses a difficult challenge for the therapist. Therefore, the therapist assesses all domains prior to deciding all interventions. Let me break down what just happened. At some point, you're going to have clients that their psychological, physical, and spiritual lives are going to all intersect. So when they all intersect at common points, it, it, it makes it hard for the therapist to decide what they need to do just by looking at one area. So before I decide the method of intervention and before I decide how I'm going to do this and how I'm going to do that, it is at that moment that I begin to understand that I have to um, assess all domains I have to assess their mental state of mind, their physical life, their spiritual life, their relationships, their history, their childhood, their, their, their religious background. I assess all of those areas because they intersect at some point before I begin to plan a path of treatment or intervention. I do not attempt to come up with a planned session of treatment before I have properly assessed the client. Again, I say, I do not attempt to come up with a planned path of treatment or intervention before I have properly assessed the client. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, Manual of Mental Disorders, the fourth edition, although we're in the fifth edition, and we're going to quote from the fourth edition, published by the American Psychiatric Association in 1994, presents a diagnosis which is identified as a religious or spiritual problem. A religious or spiritual problem is a real diagnosis. And this is, it is defined as follows. This category can be used when the focus of clinical attention is a religious or spiritual problem. Examples include distressing experiences that involve laws of questioning of faith, problems associated with conversion to a new faith or questioning of spiritual values that may not necessarily be related to an organized church or religious institution. What did I just say? Let me break it down. 
In other words, I can begin to diagnose my clients with a condition that is listed as religious or spiritual problems. That is a real diagnosis. If it affects their faith, if they're converting to a new faith, if they're questioning their spiritual values, if they have a, a background of um, abuse and um, religion is involved in it, or if they're going through a problem and it is the absence of faith of some kind, I can diagnose my client with uh, the condition of a religious or spiritual problem. Now, number four, if a Christian therapist discerns or suspects that the client is spiritually deceived, the therapist can now use that religious or spiritual problem diagnosis in their, in their session with their client. This code supports the psychotherapeutic consideration of spiritual issues during the session, even when the session is paid for by the insurance. Unfortunately, third-party reimbursement for mental health professionals is not a stage where the payment for counseling services exclusively focused on a religious problem can be routinely expected. In other words, I can diagnose my client with that problem of a religious or spiritual problem. I can even bill the insurance company with that particular problem. But it's not expected for all of my clients. If I have a caseload of uh, 40 clients, then all 40 of them cannot have religious or spiritual problems. I can't bill for every single one. It's, going, it's going to become suspect if I do so. Therefore, when the insurance companies are billed, a spiritual, a spiritual diagnosis code should only be noted secondarily as it interfaces with other primary diagnoses. So if I am going to um, bill a company, insurance company, for a religious or spiritual problem, it cannot be my primary diagnosis. It has to be a secondary diagnosis. It has to be a secondary diagnosis. In other words, I may want to get a major depressive disorder or anxiety disorder, um, but the second diagnosis may be the uh, secondary diagnosis may be religious or spiritual problem. In other words, the religious or spiritual problem cannot be my primary diagnosis and the only thing I diagnose the client with, but it can be a supplementary, um, a, a, a secondary diagnosis that can go along with it. If there is no legitimate primary diagnosis, then the insurance company should not be billed and the client will have to use self-pay or a fee for service. So we're going to go into this next point, the assessment of the client's spiritual well-being. We're going to go into that. We're still in the comprehensive assessment. Remember, there are two major areas of the comprehensive assessment. I'm talking about the spiritual well-being and the psychological well-being. Let's talk about the spiritual well-being. Assessing the client's spiritual condition can be difficult for a relatively simple reason. The presenting problem is seldom the root issue. I want you to remember something. When you're sitting down with a client, any information that they volunteer, any information that they voluntarily give you is only information that they want you to have. If you're sitting with a client and they are volunteering information, it is only information that they want you to have. The presenting problem is seldom the root issue. Take a look at a tree. When you look at a tree or an apple tree, when you look at the tree and you see the apple fruits, you know that the tree is an apple tree by looking at the fruit on it. But the, the fruit only grow because of the roots that are there. So the problems that you see are normally problems that are visible, but not the root issue. Clients may honestly tell you their, tell their counselors what has happened to them but they're less likely to share how they feel about it and what they have chosen to believe as a result of it. So they'll volunteer information, but what they're most, most likely not to tell you is how they feel about it or how, what they've chosen to believe as a result of it. What the therapist can see rather easily is a barren life. Below the surface of every struggling client lies a faulty root system. The purpose of roots when you're dealing with trees is to supply nutrients to produce fruit on the tree. If a tree is not producing fruit, it is because the tree has died somewhere at its roots. It has died somewhere at its roots. Do not attempt to repair surface issues without repairing the root system. It will, it will not produce lasting results. 
For instance, if you're dealing with uh, marriage counseling or interpersonal relationship counseling or family counseling or some type of relationship therapy, and you're dealing with two people or a group of people, and when you begin to find a series of problems that are going on, that may be the, the, the presenting problem may be that the husband and wife cannot communicate, but there may be root issues in the wife and root issues in the husband that came from their childhood that are pre that are preventing them from communicating better. That's important that you understand that you cannot attempt to repair surface issues without repairing the root system. People are in bondage to the past they have experienced because of the lies they believe. The, the trauma, the pain, the problems that you went through from childhood up through relationships, up to past jobs, up until this present moment. Have, they present lies to you for you to believe to remain in that mindset. So people are in bondage to the past they are experiencing because of the li they have experienced because of the lies they believe. Therefore, the counselor must carefully dismantle the lie without damaging the client. That's going to be challenging. You have to, in a very careful, methodical, systematic, gifted, anointed way. You have to begin to dismantle the lie that the client is believing without destroying, listen to me, without destroying or damaging the client. The most important thing that the client cherish is the lie that they believe. I know that sounds crazy, but they, their problem made them believe a certain thing and the pain made them believe a certain thing and the molestation and the addiction and the abuse and, and the grief. And all of these things made them feel a certain way and they begin to believe a certain thing. And they, 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 they cherish what they believe. They don't want to feel like this, but they don't want to let go of what they believe. So I have to begin to receive what they believe, take what they believe from them, but give them something else to believe, which is truth. So I have to take that lie from them without damaging them. So point C, the source of a faulty root system lies in three major areas. How can I know the root system? It's gonna be the areas of influence. Your root system is your area of influence. Now there are three major areas of influence. Number one, it is worldly influences. Feel that in your blank, worldly influences. That's the first thing. Worldly influences is a uh, influence of a root system. The second root system type of influence is fleshly influences. Fleshly influences. The third type of root system is this, satanic influences. So you have worldly influences, fleshly influences, and satanic influences. Worldly influences are like this, environmental influences. What, what, what do I mean by environmental influences? Environmental influences are um, influences that came from my surrounding. It may be my family, my friends, my loved ones. Um, it may, it's my environment that influences. Sometimes when I'm counseling married couples, I begin to ask them about the problems that are going on. Then I ask a question, who all know about the problem? Who do you talk to? Who did you tell about this? What did they say about this? Because I want to know about the influences of the environment. Because some of the root, root problems may be the environment that you're getting your influence from. The second one, fleshly influences, um, deals with your personal struggles. While worldly influences deal with your environment, personal influences deal, I mean, worldly, fleshly influences deal with your personal struggles. These are struggles that you have within you. These are pain that you felt, trauma that you've been through that is influencing your decisions, your belief system, and your verbiage. So we have to begin to assess the client by looking at the roots and finding out what is influencing this. The third one is satanic influences, and that is demonic influences. That is dark voices and presence of darkness from the kingdom of darkness and from Satan himself that is influencing the behavior, the mind, and the lives. Uh, for instance, suicide is a demonic influence, but it can also be a fleshly influence. It can be the pain, the trauma, the hurt that you've encountered. 
in a situation that you refuse to let go and that it is difficult to let go and you you continue until you've given place to dark spirits that spirits of death that is trying to uh, get you to take your life you see that that's worldly influence that's fleshly influence and satanic influences together so in order to find the root system i have to begin to assess the client with the freedom session asking as many questions as i can to find out those 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 areas of influences so point d separating the client's own thoughts from foreign thoughts is a critical is critical for diagnosis i have to find out is the client really thinking like this or is this the voice of others is this uh, does the client really feel like this i have to make sure that i can do that i have to separate the client's own thoughts from the foreign thoughts uh, in order to properly diagnose the client. It becomes even harder when dealing with dissociative identity disorders because these clients can seldom discern whether a thought is demonic or the expression of an altered personality. There are tools for assessment that can be routinely, routinely used in intake when discussed with the client in the first and subsequent sessions that I can begin to find out um, um, how does the client really feel and where are these influences coming from? I have certain tools that I can use that I can use in the intake or discuss in the first and the subsequent sessions in order to draw out of the client the, the, the information or the data that I need in order to properly uh, assess the client. So now we're going to talk about psychological assessments. We talked about spiritual assessments. Spiritual assessments, I'm asking questions about your background. Tell me about your background. Tell me about your religious background. Did you grow up in church? Did you, um, uh, was your family a religious family? Uh, tell me what you believe about God. I'm asking those things for a reason. Um, and I'm not trying to convert the client um, at that moment if they're not converted. But what I am trying to do, I'm trying to gather as much information as possible to know where the voice of the influence is coming from. I'm asking questions about their childhood, their, their schooling. I'm asking questions about their family, their siblings. I'm asking questions about their past. I'm asking questions about if there's any abuse and things of this nature. And your client may feel uncomfortable at some point. So you have to do it in a way where your client isn't feeling uncomfortable. Draw out of them the answers that you need with questions to find that place of influence. Now, dealing with the psychological assessment of the client, I want to bring out this. Professional therapists are expected to use the DSM-5. Uh, the DSM uh, five. Uh, Actually, I have four listed, but the DSM-5 is a diagnostic frame of reference. If I'm going to diagnose the client, I have to use the DSM-5 as a diagnostic frame of reference. As stated in the manual itself, the purpose of the DSM-5 is to provide clear descriptions of diagnostic categories in order to enable clinical representatives and investigators to diagnose, communicate, communicate about, study, and treat people with various mental disorders. That's the purpose of the DSM-5. It is so that you can diagnose, communicate about, study, and treat the people of the various mental disorders. To arrive at a diagnosis, the manual uses a multi-axle system involving five domains of clinical information. For our discussion of the psychological assessment of the client, we will discuss the fifth axis, the global assessment of functioning, GAF scale. It's the GAF scale, the GAF scale, which states the following. This is the GAF scale. I need you to pay attention to this because it's important for you to understand how to properly diagnose. The GAF scale works as such. Here's the first step of the GAF scale to understand this. History is better than cross-sectional observation. What does that mean? History is better than cross-sectional observation. Repeated observation over time is more accurate than impressions based on a single incident in a client's life. For instance, I may deal, I may be dealing with a client and they may be asking, why am I ruining every relationship that I get? Why can't I keep a relationship? <laughs> Excuse me. And I begin to ask questions about the last relationship. And I have to go back to the one before that and the one before that and the one before that. When I'm dealing with clients, sometimes I have to go all the way back to their childhood to the fourth grade. Because if you are bleeding in an area, I have to find out when did the bleeding start? Because that's when I can begin to administer the health that I need to heal the client. I can't help the client if I'm just going to treat the client with a band-aid, say, oh, you're ble bleeding. I can't point out 
the client is bleeding without finding out why and when. Why did you start bleeding? When did you start bleeding? So history is better than cross-sectional observation. So me meeting with the client one time is one thing, but I have to also have a serious, a, a series of things that I can begin to track to say, okay, this is why I say that because history is better than cross-sectional observation. The second point that I want to bring out is recent history benefits from ancient history. Recent history benefits from ancient history. What I mean by that is the evolving symptoms of an illness will help you evaluate it better. You begin to take a look at where's the client now. For instance, the client started off in a process of being in denial of saying that they cannot believe that their loved one is gone. Then they've gone from there and they're angry and they're mad and they have instances where they begin to lash out at work and they go from anger to um, uh, denial, anger, and they go into bargaining where they're trying to plead with people to be in their lives and plead with God that if you just do this, I will. Well, I understand that they're going through what is called the DABDA scale. That is the stages of depression. Now, my recent history is going to benefit from ancient history. I now take a look at what has been going on in your life for the past five years and what has been going on in your life for the past five months. And I see that it is progressive or digressive. I understand that. Now, the third step is this. Collateral information augments history from the patient. Collateral information augments history from the patient. This is what I mean. Even when clients tell us the truth as they describe it from that perspective, chances are good that we have not heard the whole truth. Even when a client is telling you about the truth, chances are good that they're not telling you the whole truth. So I have to make sure that I'm gathering as much information so that I can look at it from um, um, a perspective that the client may not be. Look I can't get caught up in my sessions where my client is telling me their story or their life or their situation from their perspective. And I'm not viewing it from the same perspective. I mean, I'm not taking the time to look at it from another perspective. I'm the counselor, so I can't get caught up and drawn into the way the client is doing it. Let's go into number four. Number four, signs are better than symptoms. Signs are better than symptoms. Signs that you actually observe a client doing are better than symptoms. What a client tells you about the presenting problems. So you have to pay attention in your sessions. Clients will give the, their body language will give them away. So sometimes I ask questions that I may not necessarily want an answer to. At least I don't want a verbal answer. Sometimes I ask questions just to see their body language, just to pay attention to how they're responding. That's what I do sometimes because signs are better than symptoms. Signs are what you observe the client doing. I see the client is nervous and uncomfortable or sad or, or, or fearful or intimidated or shy. But the symptoms are what the client tells you is what's going on. You can't get so caught up on what the client is saying that you don't pay attention to what the client is doing. Signs are better than symptoms. Number five, objective assessments are better than subjective judgments. Objective assessments are better than subjective judgments. Clinical intuition and hunches should be avoided. In other words, I should never guess at what I think is going on. I should have the patience to give my client due diligence. That's important that you understand due diligence. Take your time and work the system. Uh, properly assess the client so you can find out what is going on. Number six, crisis generated data is suspect or are suspect. The data you receive from the client is suspect. Assessment of someone in the midst of a crisis may result, result in a distorted picture of baseline intellectual and personality functioning of the clients. What I mean by that is when a client is in a crisis situation and the client begins to give you all this information, all this information, I can't trust all of the information that I get because you're in a crisis. 
and it's filled with emotions and it's filled with illogical uh, behavior and thinking. So I have to make sure that I understand the information that I get may not necessarily be concrete. The counselor must be patient and focused in this assessment period. The client must be, the counselor must be patient and focused in this assessment period. You may want to highlight that. That's my closing thought for the lesson. You have to make sure that you're taking your time, you're patient, you're working with the client, that you don't rush the client. You have to be patient in this assessment period or you're going to miss some information and you're not going to get what you need. So let's go into some homework. Here's your homework. You're going to start working on your dissertation. You have a 45-page dissertation that you have to complete in order to receive your licensing, your degree, and your licensing. This dissertation will be turned into the licensing board for review so that you can receive your license. A 45-page dissertation is going to be broke, broke down in these different categories. The first one is 10 pages. 10 pages that deal with the introduction to Christian counseling. The introduction to Christian counseling are going to have three categories. And you're going to label it as the introduction to Christian counseling and then the category. Category number one, what is, counsel or what is counseling and why is it important? You're going to write as many pages as you can. You can do one page, two pages, four pages. It doesn't matter. But you have to have at least 10 pages of the introduction to Christian counseling. And then you will go into the next phase of that. What is Christian counseling and why is it important? And then the third part of that is what are the limitations of secular counseling? They're going to add up to at least 10 pages. You can have more, but at least 10 pages. Then you're going to have 20 pages of the framework of biblical psychology. You're going to have in that category the attempt to exclude Christian counselors. You're going to talk about why do they not want you at the table. You remember we discussed that they don't want you at the table. You're going to discuss how they're working to make sure that you don't get an opportunity to practice in this field and be successful and financially successful as well because you desire to heal clients and not just help them to cope. The next one is worldview versus God view. You're going to talk about those two subjects in it. Worldview versus God view. You're going to talk about operation of hum the operation of the human brain. You're going to explain the neuron, the dendrite, the neuron which include the dendrites, the cell body, the anax and the synapse. Then you're going to discuss the advantage of laws of integration. The advantage of laws of integration. You're going to research and express the framework framework of notable Christian counselors and reference their work. You're going to have to look up. You're going to have to search Google. You're going to have to do that and find notable Christian counselors. Then you're going to have to begin to uh, research and express their fame framework about what they say about Christian counseling and what they believe and what the, how they function and how they operate. Then you're going to explain God's design for the mind. Now, you may have to go all the way back to your um, um, the Dynamics of Man course in your bachelor program and draw some information out of there. But you're going to begin to talk about God's design for the mind because that's going to be your goal to, to help and to practice. Your goal to help and to practice. Now, the next one is 12 pages of the report of an actual series of counseling sessions which which you conducted. You're going to have to have at least two counseling sessions and you cannot charge for these sessions, but you're going to have to voluntarily practice. I advise you to find someone that would um, that's telling you their problems and say, I'm in school for Christian counseling. I would love an opportunity. I'm about to graduate and receive my degree. I would love an opportunity to give you some help with counseling. And um, you're going to have to do that. Now, you can't start working on that part of the dissertation just yet because you still have to um, develop in the assessment. You still have to develop in um, practicing. 
um, approaching the client in, in your session, treat, writing treatment plans, session notes, um, uh, working in your toolbox, things of that nature. And you're going to get to that, but you're going to then go from the introduction of the client and the problem. You can't use their real name. You're going to say, this is the client that we're discussing. This is the scenario that is going on. And you're going to get all of that from your freedom sessions. You're going to have your cons consultation results. Um, when you consult the client, you're going to have your freedom session results, your session activity results, and then you're going to counseling closure explanation. How did this end? What happened? Happen. You're going to have that information. Now, the fourth part is very simple. You're going to have three pages that are going to be the insight and the advice for future Christian counselors. Insight and advice for future Christian counselors. You're going to close out saying, here's my advice for future Christian counselors. Now, you're going to print out. You're going to print out and you're going to hand deliver that. When you hand deliver it, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Office Depot. I want you to go to FedEx Kinko's. I want you to go to one of those places and tell them you want this report, this 45 page report in a bind. Uh, it can be a spiral bind, a comb bind. Um, it can be in any one of those bind, but you want it to be bound like a book. You need a cover page for it. And I want you to turn that in by the last day of class, the last day of class. Now, you can start working on it now, and I advise you to start working on it now. Do not wait until the end of class uh, before you, I mean, before January or February when you only have 30 days left or so to turn this in. No, start working on it now. Start working on the part that you can work on now so that you can continue to work on it as you go forward. I thank you so much. I give God the glory. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Work on your dissertation. Do not be intimidated by it. You can do this. Also, give your dissertation a title. Give your dissertation a title. Thank you.